right. This is the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com. And we have, as always, an eclectic mix. We have wrestlers Nia Kennedy and Chris Michaels. We have actress Jennifer Covey. We have critics Stan Shaggy and C.J. Oakland. But right now, we have formerly known as Satin Doll. She is Nia Kennedy. How are you, Nia? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show again, Evan. My pleasure. Always a pleasure. And uh, during our long trip in the car over here, we were discussing... The joy and pain of indie wrestling. So instead of doing the usual SummerSlam and G1 stuff, I'm going to give you the opportunity. If you had a, a bunch of indie promoters sitting here and you have 30 plus years in the business, what advice would you give them? And I'm just going to shut up and let you talk. Wow. Um, one thing I would definitely would tell them is... Um, Pay your workers, for one. Um, I know a lot of them do allow you the opportunity to do uh, autographs during intermission and to sell their merchandise. And that is a good one. But also, um, one, I think there's, I don't think there's any need for having more than, I would say, eight matches on a card. Because after that, you lose the audience's attention. Um, for years in the business, we never had more than seven matches on the card. So that would definitely be one. Um, two, um, maybe collaborate from time to time with each other so you don't have uh, four or five, six shows going on at the same time. Mm. I mean, for example, look at um, ROH and New Japan. They collaborated together and sold out in how long? Three days. Mm. Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Three Garden, 20,000 seats. Yeah. Boom. That should tell you something. They came into your neck of woods and sold out Madison Square Garden. I find that uh, on any given Saturday in the New York, New Jersey area, and I'm sure throughout the country, there's a half dozen or more indie shows. They all compete with each other. Very few of them draw well. And yeah, why not combine forces instead of the idiot promoters ripping each other's posters down yeah. and you know uh, help each other and do like super cards that would feel special instead of having the same pool basically of workers working for all the same promoters. Exactly. Cross, cross them over, you know. You have your stable of workers in your promotion, you know, cross over to another promotion, you know, have like, you know, your tag your champion against their champion, you know, it doesn't have to be for the belt, but you know, why not? You know, do something different, you know. I mean they all have their, their fan base, but when you guys sit there and decide, oh man, there's three shows tonight, which one do I want to go to? Like oh. you say, you go to the one that's closest to you. Exactly. <laughs> uh, as somebody jaded, you know, I'll just say, hey, the Elks Lodge is 10 minutes from my house. I'm going to go there instead of New Jersey, even if the one in Jersey has a slightly better lineup, you know, because exactly. you, you just reach a point where you go, it's not worth killing yourself to get there, and it's a long trip back, and mass transportation or whatever isn't great. So um, sometimes easier is best, and yeah. it may not be the best show. Yeah. I was to say engage with your fans, but don't let your fans run your shows right. or rule your shows. You know, it's just like there's nowadays there's a lot of workers that, I'm not going to say a lot, some that don't interact with their fans or some that do interact with their fans, faces or heels. Um, but don't let a fan dictate how you should run your show. Yeah. You know, stay on the other side of the guardrail. That's what I say. <laughs> um However, I think promoters have to get past the cronyism and nepotism and listen to the fans yes. and go, yes. you know, this kid's getting a great response. Exactly. And my girlfriend or nephew or best buddy isn't. Exactly. And, yeah, that yeah. as well. You know, it's like, yeah, you do listen to your fans to an extent, but at the same time, you don't let them run. Sure. What to dictate what your show should be. I agree. I but, agree. Yeah, definitely. And another message I would give to promoters is you not be the champion, you not be the main event, you not go through the table or whatnot because, you know, you're not necessarily the best worker or the most charismatic or even the biggest drawer on the show. Exactly. If the point of doing a promotion is to put yourself over, I think you're starting in a bad place. Exactly. The promoter I worked for for years... I mean, he was in the show, but, like, he was a manager. He didn't get in the ring of Russell. I mean, 
there was no reason for him to. You know, right. he got in the ring. I mean, he was on the sideline as a heel manager, did his thing, but he knew it wasn't about him. It was about the guy that was in the ring working. Absolutely. And that's the, the problem. Like, me being a manager, I know that with me being there, I'm there to aid, assist, and to help out my guy or girl who I'm managing in the ring. But at the same time, it's also what's going on in the ring. Sure. You know, and you see a lot of people who they forget that it's not about them. It's about what's going on in the ring. The late, great Johnny Valiant, who was not only a tremendous wrestler, but a tremendous manager and commentator. Uh, he said, the managers, you're the... Um, sugar in the coffee it's not about you you're it's not about you distracting from the wrestlers you're adding to it you have exactly. to pick your spots tell us the psychology of managing as a manager you're there there's some different aspects you've been a manager um to maybe assist and help maybe somebody who is a little green in the business to help them out right. a little bit also to occasionally cause that distraction to maybe help your guy cheat a little bit. <laughs> right. You know, whether it's distracting the ref or if the ref is being distracted to, you know, pound on the guy a little bit, you know, which I do enjoy doing from right. time to time. And I've, I've taken my bumps and my falls from time to time. That's what happens when you put your nose in the business. But Steve Austin... Uh, somebody had put a post up to Steve Austin did a year ago about the importance of managers in this business and how they should be brought back. Oh, yeah. You know, and it was a great post. I mean, I wish I had um, pulled it up and could remember what all he said, but he was talking about the greats like Gary Hart and uh, Captain Lou Albino, you know, how they added to. I grew up on Blassie Albano, the Grand Wizard, Jim Cornette, Bobby Heenan, um, Jimmy Hart. I mean... You know, these guys, and Gary Hart was awesome as yes, well. Yes. I mean, these guys really added to it. They really made it far more special. And today, inevitably, you have the beautiful female valet. And a lot of times, I don't think it adds as much. Yeah, I, me, it's weird because I kind of take offense to when people call me a valet. Because I'm like, when I first started a business, maybe, yeah. I was before when I was well, I'm still talking training. WWE. I'm, yeah. not, I'm, I'm not talking yeah. about you. Yeah, but just in yeah. general, you know, I do have yeah. people that go, oh, she's a valet. I'm like, no, I'm not a valet just because I'm a woman that I, I can be a manager of course, because of I've course. been in that ring for years taking the bumps. Taking I don't think balls. anybody was better than Sherry Martel. No, Sherry no. Martel was great. She was great. I love Sherry Martel, Precious, Sunshine. Yeah. See, I, I wouldn't look at Sherry days. Martel as a quote unquote valet. She she got in the ring. She took bumps. Yes. She was part of the show. She was. She oh, was yeah. exactly. And she was one of my favorites. Her, Gary Hart, um, Paul Ellery. Those are the ones that I truly like looked after. I mean, there's a so many great managers, you know, that I could name. Bobby Heenan was great. But, like, a lot of people don't realize, like, Paul Ellery and um, Gary Hart, they were managers, managers. They took care of everything for their workers. Oh, yeah. Hotels, flights. Oh, yeah, yeah. They got there on time. Paul Ellery was a real job. manager. Yes, he was a real manager. Yeah. You know, and I would sit there, and people don't realize that man is so smart. Very smart. I would sit there and listen to him talk. You know, after the shows with the Road Warriors, with Hawk and Animal, and listen to him talk, and you're just like, you're like, wow, this yeah. man is a genius. Yeah. You know, and the best thing you do is learn, learn. Like, my years in the ring and on the road, and I tell you, like, I went to Colorado a couple weeks ago for vacation. Went to go see my sons, and then I went to Colorado to go spend a weekend with one of my friends who I shared ring time with, you know, as adversaries. And we went through her um, wrestling bin and pulled up flyers. And from time to time, like on Thursdays, I'll post them, you know, and post it to go back to 1990, like when the uh, Rock and Roll Express run or like uh, Nails or um, Big Boss Man, you know, the Samoans, you know, all those guys that I work with. And I sit there and I looked and I'm like, wow. You know, I sit there and look at some of the flyers. And I'm like, there were some nights I wrestled two, three times a night. Wow. I have my match. I had the mixed tag, and if there was a battle royal, I did a battle royal too. Wow. You know, and I looked at some of them, and it'd be like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I was like, I was on the road a lot, you know, and I just, I hope that for the younger generation that's in the business now, 
that they are able to if they work hard and focus on their craft and not worry about what other people are doing, just focus on themselves. Being able to make a living doing this like I did. I never job. Wrestling was my job. Hmm. That was my main job. And I made a good money. I get made good money doing it, not all, only in my pay, but merchandise as well. Sure. You know? So since we have you here and uh, like I said before, I, I get just plain bored talking about WWE. It's like, it's overkill. What advice would you give to a young wrestler just starting out? I'll tell you, just from my perspective, as a, as a radio host, not even the things I do in wrestling, um, I'll go up to a wrestler and say, why don't you come do my show? Do you have a business card, you know? And they'll go, I don't have a business card. I'm like, I'm, so I'm thinking, now I'm going from respected athlete to misguided kid in 30 seconds. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of the wrestlers also, they don't even have videos of them working, which if you want to get to that next level, you're going to need professionally shot videos showing you working the crowd, not just doing 37 high spots, yes. um, which WWE and the major promotions don't care about anyway. No, no. They, they want to see you controlling that crowd. Yes. Um, I would say the average kid has no conception of marketing themselves, merchandising themselves. I, I think they're be, um, virtually clueless. Even coming on a show and promoting yourself, which we offered to multiple people who couldn't be bothered on a Sunday morning, you know, this show could reach potentially several thousand people who never saw them work before. Exactly. So. And we could have shown video clips of these these athletes. So it, all of these things are missed opportunities. They are. They are missed opportunities. I would say I suggest for one, education. Education is key. Get your Go to school. Finish high school. Go to college. Whatever you need to do first. Because um, you can't wrestle forever. You can't wrestle forever and you never know what's going to happen. You can get injured and not ever be able to, to wrestle again. You know Take and take care of yourself. That's another key. Take care of yourself. Gym, chiropractors, uh, stretching, all that. You've got to do that. Take care of yourself. Eating, eating healthy, doing all that. You must do that. And I see a lot of that now in some of the bigger promotions and some of the indies guys that I have met over the years that are doing that. Taking care of themselves and being serious about their craft. You know, and stop worrying about what the other guy is doing. I see a lot of that too. People are so worried about what's going on over there, they're not focusing over here. And I tell people all the time on my page that it doesn't matter what's going on outside of what I'm doing. My focus is on what I'm doing because as long as you keep worrying about what somebody else is doing, you worrying about that, you're missing an opportunity that you weren't paying attention to because you're so focused on what somebody else is doing. Hmm. Worry about yourself, take care of yourself, save your money. Please save your money. And put some of that money into merchandise. Yes, merchandise. And as anybody. somebody who's been a vendor many, many times, people like different things. Somebody might like an 8 by 10 for an autograph. Somebody else might like a DVD of your matches. Somebody else might like a t-shirt. Right. People are into different things. Exactly. Take some of that money and invest in yourself, exactly. of course. Exactly, and that's what I'm in the process of doing right now. Because back when I was in the business, only merchandise you, you, you sold was pictures. Right. Either color or black and white 8x10s. And I can tell you in 15, 20 minutes, I made $300 in 8x10s. Sure. Boom, that quick. You know, and you, you take that and then you take your, your pay, which you get per night. And you're making more in one night than you would do two weeks working a, a 9 to 5 job. Sure. 40 hours a week. You know, and it's all about marketing and marketing yourself. You know, it's just like when I decided to come back to the business and manage, I didn't take it half heartedly. I talked to a good friend of mine uh, named um, Matthew Robles. He goes by MK. He works for um, right now. He's, he's also working for House of Hardcore. Mm -hmm. But I talked to him and, I, and he says, you know, watch these videos. Do this. Do this. If you're serious about doing it, do it, you know, but do your research. And I, I, that's what I did. I spent the entire summer doing research and studying and everything before I decided to go out. 
And when I decided to, me and my my best friend, who you met when we did the all women show, uh, Sabrina, right. we went to some of the local indie shows and met with some of the promoters. I met with Gino Caruso, told him what I wanted to do. He invited me to another show. I met um, Bobby and Jack and the, when they were the disassemblers at the time. And because of the, all the years the experience I had, they asked me to be their manager. Right. And that's how I started. Then I went from them and then I managed Jazz when she was the NWA ch- Women's Champion. And then Eric Jaden, you know, so it's all uh, a progress. Yeah. You know, now the next focus is getting out of the tri-state area. You oh, know, yeah. like promotion I worked for, we were based out of Colorado. And we maybe did one or two shows home a year. The rest of the time, we were all on the road. Hmm. So you mentioned earlier about a lot of wrestlers working for free. <laughs> Tell us the pluses and minuses of that. I'm no sure there are more minuses. There are, no, there are no, no pluses. There are no pluses in that whatsoever. Um, my philosophy is if you wouldn't work for free, why would you want somebody else to work for free for you? That's my key. You know, and sometimes they're like, oh, they're students, okay. Well, they're students, and back in my time, you didn't get into a ring in front of a crowd until you were done with school. I mean, there's always, you know, going back and training and always, like, improving your skills that I get. But once you're done being a student, per se, and you're on the road traveling all the time, you know, you know, if there are students, maybe do, like, a all-student show or something like that. Or I understand you put them in a couple of matches, whatever, but still, pay your workers. Pay your workers. Even if it's nominal. You know, no matter what. Like, my very first show I did, I got paid $25. Right. You know, but, you know, we were at home, but the moment that, as you start getting better, you know, there's guys now that don't even make that. Yeah. You know, so. So, but, you feel it's exploitative. I do. Yeah. I do. I mean, like, I don't know what the, what the, understand you know maybe I should sit down sometime and sit with a promoter and ask him what's the reason behind that you know but still my philosophy is is you wouldn't go to your nine to five job and work for free so why would you work free at a job that if you got hurt you wouldn't be able to go to your job that pays you I I agree I'm just (laughs) you're preaching to the converted (laughs) Um, I feel it's an exploitative business even even with the endless ticket sellers, it's, um, you know, a lot of these guys are not ready to be in the ring. And, and it becomes an endurance contest for the fans. They're there four hours, four and a half, five hours. And um, I understand the economics of it. But at the same point, it's it's really not for the fans to sit and watch amateurs. No. You're paying, you know, a fee yeah. to watch professional. It used to be called professional wrestling. Yeah. You want to do amateur wrestling, go watch amateur wrestling. So um, in October, we're going to have an, our second all-women's show. We haven't decided on the date yet, right. but we're going to do this um, prior to the WWE's all-women's all pay-per-view. pay-per-view. And um, what's, your, what's your take on that, on the all-women's I show? I think it's wonderful. You know, it's great. You know, it's like... Um, I think it's they've proven themselves. They do excellent matches. I mean, like now they're having where some of the women have been the main event, you know, and they do good work. So why not give them their own pay per view? I mean, it's not the very first all women's pay per view. Yeah, TNA because done you got you got TNA Shine Shimmer. They've all yeah. done it, but it's the first time for WWE. So that is a big deal because usually as the women being you know put behind the men. They're putting them up front, and I think that is progress, and I think it's a good thing. Okay, so now I'm going to come off as the, um, I hope not sexist, but uh, <laughs> possibly negative. Um, I watch WWE fairly regularly, and um, I don't think I've seen 10 quote-unquote great women's matches in 10 years. I think... Um, Asuka is awesome. I think Natalia is awesome. I think Charlotte Flair's had some great matches. She has. Um, I think Becky Lynch is good too. Yeah, she's very. I, good I don't. I don't think Alexa Bliss is any kind of wrestler. You know, I think she's okay. She's okay. She makes a great heel though. Oh yeah, she does. She does. She does a great job being a great heel, and that sometimes, sometimes that helps because she's great on the mic. So sometimes you don't have both but if you have like if she's great on the mic and she has the fans that hate her 
and it's okay. I mean, she does decent ring, but I think it helps that everybody hates her because she has those yeah. great skills as a so heel. So she has legit heat. Yeah. But I think Natalia is ten times the wrestler. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, definitely. So personally, you know, I, I don't care what they look like. I just want to see a great match. Exactly. I would like to see Natalia wrestle Sarah Del Rey, who's not even on TV. Right. I'd like to see Natalia wrestle Asuka. Yeah. I don't care how pretty they are. I don't care what they're wearing. I just want to see great. Re it's the same when I watch the men. Exactly. I want to see. I watch wrestling for the wrestling. I do so, too. So a lot I, of times I watch it on on mute. <laughs> yeah. Because there's sometimes that like I'm just like oh here this so and so cutting a promo again. You know, and it's just like, and then, you know, and then it's, it's just some people, they can speak on the mic, and there's some that just can't. And no matter how hard they try, they're not ever going to be able to speak on the mic. And that's not new in this business. <laughs> well, that's that's the that's the men also, of yeah, course. Yeah, it's of both course. sides. Um, but, I, like, like Carmella's the champion, and I'm like, these matches aren't that great. I mean, she's a good heel. They hate her, but the matches aren't that great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot. But I'm just saying I don't have this same level of enthusiasm for this pay-per-view. Right. I'm, I'm just hoping yeah. that when they do it, that they do a good job and prove people wrong. Because, I mean, like, I mean, the same could be said about some of the men's matches, too. You know, oh, absolutely. Like some matches, but, you know, it's like we never know until we see, you know, because it's time and time again they have stepped up. And, like, and killed it, you know. Oh, yeah. So, I guess. Yeah. I've seen Bailey in some real good matches. Yeah. Um, what I would like, getting back to something you said earlier, I don't think you need more than seven matches. No. And that's why NXT uh, takeovers are so good. They have five or six matches and they all mean something. Yeah. I think that's what they should do with this pay-per-view, the yeah. women's pay-per-view. Have, have maybe six or seven matches with real feuds that mean something that are culminating on that night you know, with titles at risk and, you know, real feuds where you feel something yeah. and uh, just opposed to throwing that. Like, WWE has this habit. They'll just throw three people, six people, eight people together haphazardly, you know, where there's no real connection. And yeah. what what is my invested interest? Why do I care who wins this? Exactly. Let's throw eight women in the ring and just, you yeah. know. I think what they need to do, too, is they should bring back the women's uh, tag team. Those. Oh, yeah. They have so many women in yeah, we, there. Yeah, we were talking about the jumping bomb yeah. angels before. How great were they? Oh, my goodness. Them and... But that's what Leilani I'm talking about. They wrestle. Yes. And, you know, the opportunity to meet these women at the last CAC show and sit there and talk to uh, Princess Victoria, who I absolutely adore. I mean, by the end of the CAC, I was calling her mama, you know, and sit there and talk to Judy Martin and tell her how much, you know, her... Um, that match meant to me because it was a great match, you know? So, um, I think they should, because there's so many women in the WWE that they need to bring tag, to, uh, have tag titles on raw and on SmackDown because there's enough women in there. You can't keep oh, yeah. having them fight for the same belts when you have so many different belts for the men to win. My favorite woman wrestler is Gail Kim. <laughs> I think she's she she's beautiful and she can wrestle. Yeah, she had a great trainer though too, Ron Hutchinson. Oh yeah, I know Ron. Ron's Up a great in Canada. guy. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, I love Ron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, now I'm going to ask you the tough question. So brace yourself. Okay. <laughs> You're a mom and a wrestler. Yes. Would you recommend? to a daughter or a niece or uh, your best friend's daughter or niece or whatever the case may be to become a woman wrestler knowing knowing there's a shelf life knowing you could get hurt at any minute knowing there could be permanent damage knowing you could be future endeavored two years from now whatever the case um actually yes i would um i would support them like my my granddaughter wants to be a wrestler she's actually wrestling on her high school um, girls wrestling team in Canada. Every one really of my up. audience just went, I can't believe she has a granddaughter. <laughs> you don't look like you have a granddaughter. <laughs> and in high school. I mean, yeah. she's not my granddaughter by blood. You know, my my son and her mom are engaged to be married. But um, she calls me grandma. Huh. You know, I love her to death. She is, she'll be great in this business. I think she will. Um, like Sam me be that. She started off with being a, a collegiate wrestler amateur wrestling which is going to just make her you know a diamond in the rough when she gets into the wrestling business but 
and I told her the same thing that, that Jake Roberts told her. Education first. Good. Education first. What what about the fact that in WWE she'll be most likely working 250 days a year and the toll it takes on the human body? Um, if that's what she wants to do, I'm not going to like discourage her in any way. I just tell her like I tell anybody else, um, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. I when I started in this business, the when I started training, my son was two months. Right. So literally, he was with me in the gym every day. The promoter would be holding him in his arms while I was in the ring training. Wow. I mean, as he got a little older, he couldn't go to the matches anymore because he thought that mommy was getting hurt. Yeah. And yeah. you know, like, and he would and he would cry. So I had to keep. Him he didn't like that the fans while. booing mommy. No, or or mommy getting hurt in the ring. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't like that for a while. But then when he got older, you know, he got back into it again, and he wrestled for a while. I, I trained him, and then he, he trained again for a little bit with um, the Beast uh, over in um, Iowa. Or the Quad Cities, I believe, is where the training facility was. But um, now he's working on his career right now, working at the University of Iowa Hospital. So, And then my younger son, he um, is doing his thing, trying to be a filmmaker. So, so yeah. And they support me. You know, they support me. They want to make sure that I'm okay. And everything's good, you know, and they're like, you know, make sure you follow the same thing you tell everybody else, you know, take care of yourself, invest, you know, like back in the day when I was on the road, you know, like as soon as I got home, the first person I called was my chiropractor, Wow. you know, come adjust me because like people don't realize, you know, all, every time you take those bumps, those falls, like a mini you know, whiplash. It's like, yeah, it's like being in a car crash. So take yeah. care of yourself. And luckily for me, I never had any major injuries hmm. while I was on the road. You know, I've pulled muscles um have had stitches from you had, you had a bad open. concussion you told me oh, last I've had time. a few back concussions yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I had a concussion one time and um Rick Rude had to carry me back from the ring to the locker room because I was knocked out so yeah a few concussions you know and so, so Rick Rude passed at 40 yeah 40 years old we both lost a lot of friends in this business a that's lot. A, that's another thing that takes a toll on people yeah it does it does, but you know, it's just like, you've got to take care of yourself, you know, but back then, you know, like we were going to shows and partying all night and then getting up and doing the drives again to the next day and repeating it, you know, going to the gym, going out, partying, drinking, whatever. That was the lifestyle that we lived back then, yeah. you know, but it's like, you got to take care of yourself. Like I walked away from the business because for me, it was more important to be a wife and a mother. Sure. That was my main priorities. You know, it's like I'm, I I can't trust my kids and best my baby with anybody. So I stayed home. And then when my kid got old enough and got to school and my husband at the time was okay with it, then I went back. I interviewed Sherry Martell four in the morning, four in the morning on radio live. I'll never forget. She said to me very sadly, she goes, I've been on the road 15 years. I didn't see my kid grow up. I'll never forget it. Yeah, and I didn't want to miss that, but the career I took basically did the same thing to me as a chef. I mean, like, you work all the time, so, like, right. I got to see just only a couple of my older son's football games when he played football. At least they ate school. well. Yeah, they did. <laughs> <Yes>. They did. <laughs> and my younger son, I got to see a few of his, his basketball games, wow. you know, but this, that's a sacrifice you make to make sure that your kids have a better life. All right, I'm going to put you really on the spot now. If you were a ticket buying wrestling fan, mm -hmm. who would be the three or four or five women wrestlers you would pay to see? As who of would, right now? As of right now. Definitely Asuka. Yeah, Asuka's She's my great. number one. Yeah. Uh, Natty for Nostalgia Regions because I used to work with her dad. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, and her uncle, Davey Boy. Um, Becky. Um, I'm had I've been showing some. I mean, it could be in, Indies. It could be Japan. I've been showing some in, in be... Tessa Blanchard. She's Tessa doing Blanchard. well. Okay. She's doing really good right now. And um, hmm, you know who I really like, and she's local, and she is killing it right now, and I'm so proud of her. And that's Allie Rex. Oh yeah, yeah. I would pay to see one of her shows. Yeah, you see, when, when someone like yourself who's in the business and has seen the best of the best and work with the best of the best, that's a 
tough question. It Who is. would you actually pay to see, enjoy seeing, go to the trouble of seeing? So that that's high praise. Yeah. And one thing I like too is like another thing for me is to be a fan of yours because I'm a fan of wrestling. I've been a fan since the very first time I turned on my mom, turned on the TV and watched AWA and watched Nick Bockwinkle. How great was he? There. I was watching Nick Bockwinkle in arenas in his 50s and he was still great. Yeah. I mean, awesome. You know, I didn't understand it when I was a little kid, but I just knew that I was like, I was just mesmerized by him as a little girl. Just wow. See, he, you know what's interesting with him? He would get on the microphone and he wouldn't yell. Yeah. He would just very calmly, with a high level of vocabulary, yes. tell you what he was going to do to exactly. the guy. Exactly. You know, because people say like, why are you angry? Like when people would shout and yell in their, in their promos, it's like, why are you mad? Yeah. You know, there's other ways to get your point across without being angry, you know. Just say what you got to say, what you're going to do. There's no need to yell. I like the I mean, heels who were funny. Yes, <laughs> like yes. Roddy Piper yeah. and uh, guys yeah. like that. Like, I got the opportunity to work with uh, Kevin Sullivan in Vegas. And, um, like, people say sometimes, oh, you're a heel, you're not supposed to smile. I'm like, I smile because I enjoy being sinister. It's a sick thing for me, right. you know. I smile. My, I enjoy inflicting pain on people. So for me to smile... It's just like, you wonder what's going on in my mind. Oh, she about to do some really messed up stuff right now. Kevin yes, Sullivan was great, too. Yeah, he was. I saw Kevin Sullivan wrestle the original Sheik. Ooh. <laughs> going, that's that how far good. back I go. That would have been good. But the one thing that will also have me be a fan of yours as well is attitude and not having an ego. Yeah. You know, why are you having an ego? There's no need for you to have an ego and to think you're better than everybody else. Because you're not. We're all in this together, you know. And I've met a lot of people in this business that have egos. Oh, yeah. And I've met twice as many that did not. What's always interesting to me is you'll meet somebody who's incredibly accomplished, like a Nikolai Volkov, um, who was a dear friend of mine. And he um, was the most humble, yes. nicest guy on the planet. And then you get somebody who's accomplished virtually nothing, nothing. And the guy's an egomaniac. Yeah, and horrible in the ring. We were talking about that. I'm not going to name the person, but we were talking about that in the car on the way in. You know, it's just like, you suck as a wrestler. Sorry, you're horrible. Suck as a human being. As a human being. And then you have an ego to back it up, you know, to have an ego on top of that. And there's just no need for that. You know, like they used to say back in the day is like, the hills were the nicest people, you know. Oh, yeah. And the faces oh, yeah. were not. And I used to say, well, that's because of the fact that the faces are bothered constantly by the fans all the time. So, you know, there's and, no and, reason. And part of it is, the f I'm, I, we're making generalities because I, I have friends who are faces who are nice also. Yeah. But, but many times they need that applause. Yeah. And the heels look at it as I'm acting and I'm yeah. doing a good job because exactly. I'm getting them to hate me. Exactly. There was no nicer person on planet Earth than Nikolai Volkov. Yeah, he was and he got them to hate him. Yeah. That's that's yeah. that's a great skill. Exactly, you're going out there to do something. Like they say, if by the time you get to the ring, people don't know who you are, what side you're on, you're not doing your job. Johnny Valiant used to tell me, you walk down the ring for that minute or two. He said, within seconds, the fans have to understand. He's the good cowboy. He's the bad cowboy. He's the good Indian. He's the bad Indian. If you haven't done that, you, you know. People are just confused. They yeah. don't know who to root for. This Today you have, oh, he's a tweener. He's, you know, a heel that people like. He's a face that people don't. It, yeah. it gets very muddled. Yeah, but the thing is not everybody can be Steve Austin. And that exactly. was Steve Austin's gen right there. You know, he was the, the badass who kicked butt. And but, didn't follow but, any rules. But it was very clear what his role was. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But today, like, it's like everybody wants to be cheered, even mm -hmm. though they're the heel. Yeah. and. It doesn't always work. Yeah, no. Exactly. You know who's great? Um, Thomas Ciampa in uh, NXT. Yes. This guy, he gets legitimate heel heat. You don't see that too often mm -hmm. anymore. No. They hate this guy. No, exactly. That's how great he is. Yeah. I mean, in 2018, when it's all out there, I mean, they they legitimately hate this they guy. Do. And I love it, like, when, we're, when me and Eric are out for a match and, like, a lot of the shows we do, especially for, for Gino, for ECPW, a lot of kids. And you have the kids just yelling and screaming yeah. and hollering, you know. And I, I love to turn around and just look at them and go, oh, your parents should have put you up for adoption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or here goes another burden on society, you know. And they're just like, 
shut up, I hate you. And I'm like, and I just turned around like, good, I've done my job, you know? Right. And you have the guys who are like, ooh, baby, ooh. I was like, really? Mm. It's like you're beneath me, please. Wow, wow. <laughs> and while we're talking wrestling, I just want to uh, recommend a great website, prowrestlingstories.com. And uh, I'm a contributor. I just uh, did a piece on Gorilla Monsoon and uh, Nikolai and Nicole Bass and a lot of uh, people we've lost. So uh, ProWrestlingStories.com, if you like history and not over-analysis of <laughs> meaningless TV angles. Right. So uh, anything you'd like to plug before we bring Chris Michaels on? Um, I have... Two shows coming up, uh, both on August 25th. I'm <laughs> doing a double shot that day. The first one is for ECPW at um, Broad Channel Athletic Club. Bell time is 7.30. And then after that, we're going to a uh, law show at the May Day Community Center. Um, Eric will be uh, going for the, the LAW uh, title. Eric Jaden. Yes, Eric Jaden. There you go. There you go. Any uh, websites, any social media you want to plug? Uh, Nia Kennedy on Facebook, um, Feisty All Day on Instagram, and Nia Kennedy on Twitter. Okay, and when we come back, we're going to add Chris Michaels to the conversation. Veteran, he was ECW tag champ. He was in WWE. He's a good friend of ours, and uh, he's been at the station many times. So in just a bit, wrestler Chris Michaels will join the conversation. We'll be right back.
hope But dreaming of that down And you wanted to leave When it all starts to seem like you hope Hope is all just words you speak Words you speak Ginsburg show at Village Connection Radio and it's not often that we have royalty on the show but uh, about to join us is wrestling great Sir Christopher Michaels. found out that uh, Exotic Adrian Street had a um, had also had a company that manufactured wrestling gear. Uh, he decided to go ahead and get it made by somebody who of course had some of the greatest costumes in wrestling back in the 80s plus it's being made by a wrestler and not somebody that's not in the business. So we would be sensitive to what I want for my design. So what actually what I'll do is I'll let you see the, the back of my cape, if you're able to. And it has my name on the back. And, um, wow. You see where it has uh, the, the, uh, the, the crest, which I designed myself, the lion and unicorn, the God Save the Queen, Union Jack over the American flag, which uh, was symbolizing at my claim being the only American knighted by the queen, but now that's 
all pissed away now because Giuliani was knighted. Uh, several other people were knighted, so it's, it became trivial. But my, my claim to my being knighted was that I helped break up the marriage of Prince Charles and Princess Diana by introducing him to Carmela Bowles Parker. There you go. And for my efforts, the Queen... A little just, history uh, that we weren't aware of. So that's... Uh, I helped. I helped to uh, split that up, and to the to the pleasure of all the the royals. Yeah. So that was that little bit of wrestling trivia. Although um, while I was in ECW, we um, I was part of the uh, trifecta, the triple threat tag team, kind of like the fabulous Freebirds, which was called the Suicide Blondes. Chris Candido, God rest his soul, Johnny Hotbody. And myself, which they didn't call me Sir Christopher Michaels then because it was Sir Christopher Candido. So they ended up calling me Sir Richard Michaels Dick for short. So, yeah. But um bum. But um bum, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, things kind of morphed from there. When the uh, Suicide Blondes split up, ECW went from Eastern Championship to Extreme. Then I just kind of reinvented the character and then brought it up to the. Uh, the Northeast on the independent circuit and took off from there. Uh, the late Tommy D with the um, Universal Wrestling Superstars, my many, many matches with the Bodyguard for Hire, street fight matches. But as you could see, Bodyguard for Hire, you are no longer on the scene. I still am. So that just goes to show you, at 57 years old, ladies and gentlemen, I've got staying power. Wow. And you're wrestling the great Tony Atlas, uh, yes. all-time legend. Tell us about that. That will be coming up September 8th. It will be in Boonton, New Jersey, at the Boonton Elks Lodge. It will be the main event. It will be myself facing Mr. USA Tony Atlas. And I know later on, uh, Mr. Savali here will have a promo that I did, short and sweet and straight to the point, which will describe what a, a little bit what's, what's happening. Tony Atlas is no kid. How, how, how old is Tony now? Uh, I believe he's in maybe his late 60s. I'm, uh, late 60s? Wow. I would think. I would think. Strange. I mean, I'm not the... I, I don't yeah. want to uh, yeah. you know, speculate, but I know he's a bit older than I am because, of course, he was in the business way before I got involved. Hmm. Do you want to play the video now? Sure. Why Let's not? Go. Since uh, Evan brought up the show, don't get up. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't make a bologna sandwich. you got to see this. SWF Live Pro Wrestling, September 8th, Booton, New Jersey at the Booton Elks Lodge. I will be facing Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, in the main event. But what I need to know, Tony, will I be facing Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, Saba Simba, Tony Atlas, or will I be facing the... <laughs> Laughing Fool Tony Atlas. Whichever one is coming on September 8th, remember one thing. You may not like me, but you damn sure will respect me when we are finished. Wow. Wow. That was intense. So, um, this is out in Boonton? Boonton, New Jersey. Uh, SWF Live Wrestling. Um... Little history behind that, the owner of the company, well, one of the co-owners of the company, Rob Fury, who is my wrestling legacy, my wrestling son, who I saw potential in and broke him into the business. And uh, never did I think in my wildest dreams that he would evolve to become a wrestling promoter and now having a legitimate, recognized wrestling organization in New Jersey. Yeah, they've been out there a long time, right? But about seven years now he's been promoting and he's met... That's like dog like years in wrestling. How many, how many promoters have lost a fortune in seven years? The guy's still out there. My, still respect. Out, he's, he's got staying yeah. power. And that's the yeah. one thing that I'd like to say that I instilled in him is to not give up. And that's one of his mantras. That's why he calls himself Unbreakable Rob Fury. I've seen um, I've seen wrestling promoters get broken in one or two years, burning through hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, Naya? Yes. Oh, well, yeah. it happens because a lot of times uh, when 
a lot of independent promoters are starting their wrestling business. Everybody's in their ear. Everybody wants to get their shot. Everybody's, you know, trying to jockey in for position. You know, it's kind of like when you're on the LIE and one lane is closed and everybody's trying to merge into that one lane. You know, that's like what it is. Or when, you know, you're, people are trampling themselves to get out of a soccer game when, when the winning team, I mean, their team that they want loses and they riot. You know, and people trample themselves trying to get out. It's kind of like the same plus, thing. Plus, the promoters always want to book their childhood idols who uh, inevitably give them the mock price, <laughs> right? Uh, well, then, you know, then you have these charlatans that are out there that I won't mention people by name because I'm not going to. And there's uh, too many to, to mention. And, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't have right. enough time on the show. That's right. But there are guys that are out there that legitimately love the business. They wholeheartedly go out there and do this. And Rob Fury, I love you. You're a great kid, and I say kid, but he knows what I mean. Uh, and you're, I, I want to bring up also the, the, the generosity and the heart that this man has. And I'm only going to pick my phone up because I want to uh, talk about an event that's coming up one week, actually six days now, because we're today's Sunday. Next Saturday, there's going to be an event that I really don't want to be at, only because it's because of the tragic death of a four-year-old child. Mm. We know him as the hero of hearts, Lucas Hines. And we are doing a benefit show for him. Everyone who goes there is going there on their own. They're doing it on the arm. 100% of the proceeds goes to this family to help defray the costs of the funeral expenses. And I'm just seeing if I could find my... The post, there should be a poster up. It's in Jackson, New Jersey. It's coming up. The Jackson Firehouse number 5 or 55, if I'm not mistaken. And all I can say is, if you could attend the show, um, please do. If you cannot attend the show, and you could make a donation. What, for tickets, what time is the show? Uh, doors open at 6, show starts at 7. Okay. Um, if you could donate tickets, I'm sure that there are some families that are out there that may not be financially capable of going to the show, but they do want to support this cause, and you want to donate tickets, and you can't be there. Coming from a conservative Republican, give till it hurts. Yeah, that's right. You don't hear a lot of people say that, but I'm not like every conservative Republican that's out there either. I do have a heart. You're a, a true compassionate conservative. Unlike many. Unlike many. Yeah. That the, yeah. poor, poor Evan had to, unfortunately, had to break friendship with those uh, <laughs> couple folks that he's known for a long time. But getting back to the um, this benefit show, I'm actually able to compose myself concerning this. Um, this, this that I wanted to say that SWF Brotherhood restores my faith in humanity, that within a matter of days they put this together and selflessly did this. They set up fundraising pages. They're raising money. And I, I couldn't be prouder of Rob and his company for doing what they're doing. Um, like I said, this is something I hate to have to go to because of why we're there. But at this event, there will be no videos, no photos. This is a sacred event. It's going to be a show like no other show being done in the memory of this child and without letting myself get emotional I'm just going to leave it at that please if you can come and how much are tickets I know what's on the poster that's on there I know you can go to Eventbrite 20 I'm going to tell you sure go ahead Jim you're, you, you, you see tickets start at $20 for ticket information call 201 539-3558 it's at the Jackson Fire Station 55, 113 North, New Prospect Road, Jackson. Yeah. So for $20, you can support a great cause, see a great show, do the right thing. And um, it's nice when the wrestling community occasionally is a community. Instead of, you, you, usually the promoters are killing each other. This is something we could all agree on and come out and support this. Well, I mean, if you were truly in this wrestling brotherhood, sisterhood, or you're part of the wrestling brethren, when one of us hurts, we all do. And in any wrestling organization, like I tell any of the young guys coming in here, if you're a veteran and there's a young guy or girl 
that's trying to break in their business, trying to get exposure, and they seem to be the weak link and you do nothing to help them, you're part of the problem. We're supposed to support each other because remember something, we are only as good as the weakest member of our team. And that goes with anything, whether it's wrestling, whether it's the military, whether it's your job, any place. If you do nothing to help somebody that needs help and guidance rather than laugh at them and point your finger at them and say that they're terrible, that's not supporting the cause. And ironically, sometimes people start terrible and, and years later they're, they become great. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it takes time to develop and the right, the right person to mentor you. Well, you have to have someone that won't give up on you. Look, I remember when Randy Orton first got going, he was horrible. Horrible. And now but, it's horrible again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah. But I remember seeing a plenty of missed spots on some of these tapes that they did. And, you know, because of the family name, he got a spot, which happens a lot. You know, you become a legacy. Now he's, now he's uh, as good as anybody, but he's complacent and he doesn't leave it in the ring. I'm not a big Randy Orton fan. Well, I'm not that I'm saying that I was, but I'm just using that as an example. There are a lot of guys that just because of the father's name or the mother's name in the business, they get, they get that, uh, they get, they get the push. The nepotism works. I heard you mentioning nepotism before, and that's nepotism in its finest. But at the same time, you can only help somebody who wants help and is willing to help themselves. Oh yeah, well, yeah. You see, it, it's good when somebody's honest. I've seen kids like like Naya just said. You know, they're 18, 19, 20. They think they know everything already, and they're, they're not even listening to the veteran. Yeah. Well, so, that's, the, that's the ego. You mentioned ego before. This business, there cannot be no ego. Just no. like in acting, there are no small parts, only small actors. And whether you have a speaking line or you're just part of the, the, extra. the extra in the background, there was a necessity for you to be there. So it's like saying the person that scrubs the bathroom is some kind of a a low life, but yet, if you were one of these people to go into a public restroom and it wasn't clean, some people would be the first to complain. No matter what you do, you have to have humility. I'm doing radio 27 years. Somewhere there's somebody that's done it 47 years who could teach me. No, seriously. You it's, always can learn. Of course. You always of learn. Course. You know, uh, just because you have time in the business, sometimes you get jaded. Uh, sometimes you... Uh, I guess get to the point of where you just had enough. I went through that a bit ago. I dropped off the scene. But I thought to myself, you know, I dedicated a great part of my life for this. I sacrificed a lot for this. And I've got grandchildren that I would like to see me in the ring. So I want to at least stay young enough and in shape enough, which I am trimming up, I'm getting myself in shape, ready for this event, Tony Atlas, I hope you're listening, because my cardio, conditioning, and everything is getting to the point of almost like how I was combat ready in the Army, so it's no laughing matter, Tony, I am coming for you. And let me just say one thing as an old school fan, and Naya, jump in. The fact that you have a beautiful professional robe, it, it immediately gives you credibility walking down the ring as opposed to some kid in jeans and sneakers or whatever the case may be. I mean, like, right, well, Naya? Exactly. He looks, he looks like a main event wrestler. Yes, he does. Well, the thing I try to stress to these kids is wrestling gear is not coat hanger ready in Walmart. Yeah. Oh, you have man. to invest in yourself. It's like an auto mechanic that has a pair of vice grips and a socket set and he wants to fix your car. If you don't have a whole Snap-on Tools uh, tool case filled with tools to fix a car, you're not a mechanic. You're as a handyman. As a vendor, I've had wrestlers at the merchandise table. I think they're kids from the high school. I don't even realize they're wrestlers. They don't look the part. It's because, and I've bemoaned about this on earlier shows, especially in New York State, they took away licensing of professional wrestlers, and that to me has destroyed the indie scene in New York because there is no measuring stick. You, at the time when I broke in, you had to be in a recognized, legitimate 
wrestling school that was recognized by the New York State Athletic Commission. You had to go in the ring and train, like Naya had said. You had to train for sometimes, like for Johnny Rod's school, you had to spend six months outside the ring on a wrestling mat, locking up, pushing off before they even let you step inside the ring. Uh, uh, something just popped into my head. Let me throw this out there. So, um, Naya, we were talking about women's wrestling before. Sometimes I'll see a lady wrestler on TV. She's 90 pounds, and she doesn't look credible to me. You could kick my ass. She can't. <laughs> What's your take on that? When I started in the business, yeah. I was 105. Okay. But, I, but for me, it's all about um, perception. You know, doing the moves. You know, it's like you don't necessarily have to be the strongest, but what if you're the fastest? Okay. You know, and bit the quickest is doing moves. Well, Ray Mysterio you know? got over. Exactly. But but it's still harder to have that credibility yeah. if you're a little mm -hmm. tiny. You know. Yeah, like I, when I when I was first started, like I wouldn't get into ring with a two hundred pound woman because, of course, the they expect her to to beat me. Right. You know, so it's like, so what is your offense? Okay, so they're bigger than me, so. How about I do some fast moves and tire this person out? Right. So, but it's all about perception. But yeah, 90 pounds, no. I mean, like, I did get bigger as I got into it, but I was an athlete when I got into track, you know, softball, baseball, all that, so. Okay. What do you think, Chris? You see you well, see some kids in, 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 at Indies, the, 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 you know, they don't look credible sometimes. Well, it's going back to... As I was saying before, um, being trained at a legitimate wrestling school, having a letter of recommendation to the commission, but also as being a quote-unquote professional athlete, or at least now they're sports entertainment, so I guess maybe that's why they think it, there's no need to go to the gym because I'm watching the cosplay comic book nerds taking over the business. Where these guys couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag, they come to the store. They don't spend any time in the gym. They don't dedicate themselves mind, body, soul. Yeah, okay, they like to dress up and play wrestler. But when I see guys with sneakers and kick pads on, I want to throat punch them. <laughs> yeah. uh. it, it just it sickens me to my very core because just because one guy on TV wears that doesn't mean this is the norm for wrestling. When you mentioned about wearing professional wrestling gear, getting this, this cost me over nine hundred dollars. The cape. The tights, the trunks, the boots. And that was a while ago. It would be much this more today. This was over 25, almost yeah. 27 years ago when I purchased this. Yeah. Today, that would be thousands of dollars. And you only have one impression to make to a promoter the first time you go into that locker room and that's when you're getting put, when you get dressed in your gear. When I first started with WWF, doing my preliminary matches, we wore slacks, shirts, and ties when we traveled because we were representing the World Wrestling Federation. Yep. I was just a new kid, just got my foot in the door, and there was a guy by the name of Phil Apollo, who wrestled on ICW, the uh, Savoldi's promotion years ago, that said something to me, stuck with me to this day. He goes, if you look important, you will be treated important. So... When I go to an event and I see these same guys you're talking about, the kid that looks like the librarian that files the Dewey Decimal System comes walking in, <laughs> yeah. and he's traveling with a wrestling bag on wheels, pulling it right away, that just it tells me, I left. When I see these 300-pound big strong men, these wrestling guys traveling with a bag with wheels, I laugh. When I was in the Army, I used to carry a 90-pound rucksack on my back, sometimes with a mortar plate. And these guys can't, you're supposed to be a legitimate tough guy. You're walking with a bag with wheels. Come on. Well, that's the norm now. Everybody does that. I'll still throw my duffel bag over my shoulder and do it the old school way. Because that to me is, is, the, way I, is the way I like doing things. I, you know, sometimes old school is the best way to go. Hmm. That's just my opinion. But um, I do believe it could be taken as fact. Because look at what we have on the indie scene. Um. You know, there are, got, there are a lot of great guys out there. Don't get me wrong. You got Papa Don. Great, great, great. Papa, Papa Don guy. should be in WWE. Should have been in WWE. Homicide. Well, let me, let me just he ask you. Be there. Let me yes. just ask you. Okay. 
Papa Don and Homicide are two great examples. These guys are tremendous. Teddy Hart, Jack Evans. There's a lot of great guys out there that aren't in WWE. Do you think part of it is ageism? You know, because uh, I think they like them in their 20s and mold them and wean them. Well, to a point, but then wouldn't you want somebody with experience? Didn't Ric Flair break into wrestling well, at 35? I would. I'm saying, do you think WWE there's ageism? Well, look, when they're using a Hollywood-type writing staff to set their story angles up and, and different things like that, it shows me that the people that were in the circle of wrestling are no longer in control of this. Now, you've got these Hollywood types. Because, I, really, I think Vince is grooming people for his, uh, his movie brand that's somehow tied into Titan Sports. So they're looking more to try to push their guys to be movie actors. I mean, you can see Dwayne The Rock... Johnson, Papa uh, Don was in The Wrestler. I brought him in. (laughs) Anyway, you know, these guys are worthy of a spot. They're tremendous wrestlers, and they're veterans, and they know what they're doing, and they're reliable, and I I, I don't get it But they look the part. That's the the difference. A lot of people don't want to take the time to go to the gym. They don't want to take the time to eat right. They don't want to take the time to promote themselves. They don't want to take the time to invest in themselves, like buying professional gear. This is what the problem is that we have now is, like I said, they're cosplay comic book nerds that, you know, it's Halloween 365 for them. Right. A quick, quick question because we're running out of time. Uh, on the indie circuit, we all travel the indie circuit in different, for different reasons. Um, Mike Orlando is going to make it. Who else do you see that's going to make it in this business? It's I'm, hard asking, to say. I'm asking both of you. Well, for me, I don't, it's kind of hard to say for me because you really don't know what they're looking for. You know, look, this James Ellsworth kid got that big push because he just looked like one of the monkeys. You know, had no body. But he's perfect at what he does. That's yeah, a comedy but, role. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like Playboy Buddy Rose. Big fat guy coming out there with the muscle poses and everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, but it, Buddy Rose early 80s didn't, didn't look like right, that. When he was right. wrestling back, when he, he was in decent shape. Yeah. Yeah, the later Playboy right, right, right. Buddy Rose uh, look was a bit different, though. But you you both are on the indie scene regularly. Who do you who do you see as a total package that that could make it in this business? Male or female? I can definitely see um, Ali Rex making it. She's sure. already been on T, uh, TNA, right? No. Or Ring of Honor. I think Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor. Yeah, Possibly. she she was in one of the major groups like yeah. Cena. Yeah. Yeah, she's definitely doing her thing, holding titles everywhere she goes. Yeah. Um, for men, I can see um, Air Jaden. I think with the issue probably be age would be anything for him. But yeah, I, I think, think ageism's an chance. issue in it. Yeah. In, in, in but I think wrestling. if they give him a chance, that possibly he could make it. I he'd be perfect in WWE because they like characters. Yeah. That's a, he has a great character. Yeah, he does. It might be a little over the top for their brand, but you know there are there is well, an indie they, promotion they could tone it down, but he, he's a great character. Oh, they like oh, characters. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. From his earlier character to now, the gimmick, what he's wearing now, is so much better than what he did a few years back. Yeah. Um, there's also an indie company that just came out called Wrestling After Dark. Also, uh, Rob Fury's involved with that. Twenty one and over. So it's going to be a more of an adult theme kind, and I think Eric Jaden would be perfect for yeah. that group. He should be the champion. He'd be perfect for that. Hmm. I, I like Eric's stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Well, it's because it's, it's, it's different. It's not like everybody else. Well, the, thing, the thing with Eric is it's legitimately funny and entertaining. Sometimes somebody's just a character and you go, this is stupid. Yeah. The guy's right. entertaining. Absolutely. And he's always um, making sure and working to make sure that he evolves. Yes. That's the important thing. Is and he evolving. listens to veterans. Yes. Keyword listens. Yeah. Sometimes there's a reason why God gave you two ears and <laughs> yeah. one mouth yeah. to listen twice as hard as you talk. And we, and we, me and him, we work great together because I know what he needs. He knows what I need. We get together. We don't argue about things. We discuss it, and I do what he needs me to do. And he's solid in the ring. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I would love to see him make it. It would do my heart good. But like you said, the ages and thing. But, you know, there were a lot of guys. Like I said, Ric Flair started at, what, 35? So talk about a late 35. Sto- uh, or no, we got, he no, he went to, um, didn't he go to a WWE around that time? Or yeah. NWA? I was there. 
Look at he, at, he started WWF. in the AWA. Look at Diamond Dallas Page. Look how yeah. old was right. when he started wrestling. Yeah, yeah. I was I was there for the very first match between Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. You have no idea of how much respect I have for architectural engineers. After that event, the people stomping on the stands and everything else. I swore to God that place was going to collapse. It was. Wow. It was absolutely the most one of the most incredible spectacles I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. The match they've been waiting for. And that was like the thing in every wrestling magazine, Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Uh, the you know, the wrestling uh, the wrestling all the wrestling magazines when will they ever meet when will they ever meet and I mean I, I even wrestled Flair during the time when he came in when he was claiming to be the real world champion mm-hmm. and he had he had the belt right, right. from uh, from from the NWA WCW and then later on he used a diff they used a different belt they pixelated different belt they he, they I guess they must have had to give it back to the company but. Okay. So uh, we will be at your show September 8th in Boonton. Plug whatever you want to plug, Chris. Well, you know, I also like to plug USA Pro Wrestling. My friend Frank Goodman, nice guys. They're having a 25th anniversary show at the NYWC Sportatorium in Deer Park. It's coming up on September 15th. That's a loaded show. they got a lot of stars on that. that. I can't even go into... The amount of stars they have, but I guarantee you that is going to be a show. If you were a USA Pro Wrestling fan from uh, from years back before they moved down to Florida, you're not going to want to miss this. I'll be there. I may not be there in this capacity, but I will be there to support them because I would like to see Frank again. It'd be a, good to see the boys again. Um, again, the the shows that Naya had. Um, Plugged, I will also be there with Simply Splendid Bobby C. We will be there for that double shot. Uh, and don't forget, next week, Jackson, New Jersey, please, please, I beg of you, if you have a heart, donate, come, anything you can, please. And can you donate online even if you don't go? I, uh, yes, th- I think um, there is something for that. Uh, yes, I will... Um, I'll be sh- I have to check. I don't have the actual link, but there is a link with SWF um, Live Wrestling that does have. And give a, the SWF uh, uh, website. Well, it's um, S- you look for them on Facebook, um, SWF Live uh, Wrestling. They're, that's the, the only one that's out there. See them on there and look for, look for the event. You could uh, there's a spot there that shows the show. When you click on the Eventbrite link, you will see if you're purchasing for yourself or if you're donating tickets to someone else that may be underprivileged that can't come, just to sell the tickets for the show. And even if there are empty seats, so long as the tickets are bought, all we care about is helping to defray the funeral costs for this family. Yeah, let me, let me just say something real quick. Um, I get very tired of, in the wrestling community, Somebody will go, oh, this Kickstarter or whatever, this is a scam, and he's not really hurt, and he's not really sick. This is a four-year-old kid who died. This is legit. Support it. Support it. You got $800 for WrestleMania, throw 20 or 30 bucks in the till and help the family out. Come on. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to rationalize being cheap, but this is where it's supported. Well, this when you're doing something good. Doing something, you know, sometimes giving the last dollar in your pocket to someone who doesn't have any money does more for them, even though you gave them your last dollar, it's the only dollar they might have. I know wrestling fans who go, I never give to a Kickstarter because it's wrestling and it's a work. I go, no, this is legit. A little kid died, the family's suffering, the family's in need. Help them out, folks. Come on. It's for a good cause. No parents should ever have to bury their There's children. nothing no worse than burying a kid. Nothing worse. Right. And also the grandparents, too. The of lost course. after stuff. Of I course. have five grandkids. I know. I know I don't look like a grandpa. And that's because You of look more like a grandpa than she... She doesn't look like a grandma. You could pass. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it uh, wasn't for Just For Men, uh, beard paint yes. and, um, and uh, Nutrice hair coloring, because I don't bother with that Just For Men stuff because uh, the female product is a whole lot better, trust me. <laughs> anyway, I must wrap it up because we have more guests. But uh, anything else real quick? You want to plug? Or, uh, we're good. Oh, no, just come to ECPW. Come to LAW. Please come to SWF. Please go. 
to USA Pro Wrestling. These are just a few. And also, let me also give a shout out to the NYWC. Those are my brothers out there. I've, those guys, I've known them since they got started. Support them because they support all these other indie wrestling companies that come out there and hold their, host their events. It's a great place to go to. Evan, we've gone there several times. I've support been, indie I've wrestling. Been there more times than I can remember. Support indie wrestling. Support indie music. Support indie poets. Support everything independent because nobody gets overnight success. You need support. Speaking of that, there's a new page. Evan Ginsberg Support Independent Music Facebook what a segue. page. Support <laughs> Independent Music. Evan Ginsberg. G-I-N-Z-B-U-R-G. And how about Check our sponsors, out. Evan? Our sponsors. Are they still sponsors? It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, Timothy, Timothy Dark, Dark Music.net. Sure. Frederick Gilbert Bourne, Forgotten Titan of the Gilded Age. Scott Bernstein, DDS. Okay, and when we come back, we have actress Jennifer Covey and critics Dan Shaggy and C.J. Oakland. We'll be right back, folks. All right. <laughs> me good in a hope that I just can't defuse but I know oh, 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 the tricks up your sleeve cause you you and I used to sing just to pass by the time and I can't let go oh, 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 without a partial thought to where our song may flow some ring away but the of yours seem to stay And lately when I listen close What I hear may be fake I see you be real now And I'll be honest That what we've got here Is truly harmonic And I can search, search, search Just to hear the same sound play But why would I when you're standing here right in front of me truly harmonic oh, you've got me good it's a concept i just can't refuse but you had to see through what seems without flaw so you you may say that the sound of no more vows wrong away maybe it's true when this sound leaves my ear, I can't help but to sing it again. Hope that if I sing it out, maybe you'll comprehend. I've been around now, and all is silent. What we've got here is truly harmonic. When you think, think of me And the lyrics that we used to sing And take them for more, more, more than what they appear so, all along, I'll admit that it's all just a song All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com Jim Savalli at the helm our owner and engineer, and uh, we are joined by actress Jennifer Covey and uh, critics Dan Shaggy and C.J. Oakland, and uh, you guys have been on my show before. And uh, Jennifer, tell us about Broken Hearted, the movie. Um, so Broken Hearted is basically The Notebook, but from a guy's perspective instead of okay. a girl's perspective. Um, so it kind of has appeal to both men and women, which I like. Um, when I first read the script, I was like, this this is like the new rom-com of the indie films right here. Um, it's pretty much like this this guy who's getting his PhD and he's just kind of dating around and then he runs into this girl who's in a relationship um, and they become friends, but he thinks that they're in like a real deal relationship. And she's like, no, 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 we're just friends. So 
Um, the whole movie is him, like, trying to get her out of the relationship and, like, to be with him. And his friends are like, don't even bother doing this because it's it's not worth it, you know. And it's it's got its moments of being funny and its moments of being dramatic as well. And what's your role in the film? I play the, the girl that he's going after. I play her best friend. And I want her to be with him as well. Um, but she's just not listening to me because we all basically don't like the guy that she's with in the movie. We're like, yeah, get yeah. away from him. And she's like, no, he's great. And we're like, no, he's really not. So in, in real life, when this happens, mm -hmm. you have a girlfriend and yep. she's dating an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do? I mean, it's an awkward position. I've been in this position yeah. many times. Right, right. The first time I basically said my piece and it did not go over well and she's not with him anymore. But like, um, now I just kind of say it one time, I'm like, oh, you know, he's okay, I love him, and then I just don't even get involved, because mm. as long as, like, she's happy, I guess, that's, like, the only thing that I can really, like, I try to, I try to be forward and say, like, you know, I don't want to really be around him, but, like, I don't try to break them up or anything like that, because it just adds drama. Has the shoe ever been on the other foot where a girlfriend has said to you in the past, I don't like this guy yes. you're with? And, yes, yes. And, and how do you take that? Um... Well, this particular time, I was thinking to myself in my own mind, like, this is probably not a good idea, but I'm just going to wait for some justification from somebody right. else. And then <laughs> she basically was like, um, you need to break up with this guy. And I was like, you know what? You're right. And then like a couple of days ago, I broke up with him. So. Wow. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was dating a Korean woman and um, my mom and other people were like, you better be careful. It could be a green card thing. And <laughs> we've been married 10 years. <laughs> So, married 10 years, so it was not a green card that thing. Guy. So sometimes people <laughs> care and they give you bad advice. Right. Mm. Or they just, so. you know, sometimes people are looking at them from the outside just being like, just be aware. Like, they don't necessarily mean it to be rude, but they're like, right. you know, right. not everyone's yeah. nice. So. But it is, it, so it sounds like a film that's based in reality. Which, yes, absolutely. That's yeah. why I love it. Like, I mean, there are a lot of great fantasy movies out there and there are a lot of great, um, you know, historical movies and things like that but the nice thing about this one is like everybody can relate to it a yeah. little bit and i mean i think that's why people like things like the notebook too but personally i get tired of stuff blowing up i get tired of car and chases we were just talking yep. about that a minute ago I, I, I was just at the kew gardens film festival mm -hmm. i went for several days in a row and there's so many quality indie films and some find their audience and some don't right and um, yeah, I'm a filmmaker in my own right. You know, I was one of the producers on The Wrestler with Mickey Rock. Cool. And um, so, you know, it's tough out there. It's very tough. So I think when you start with quality, something everybody believes in, right. something that's credible, you know, I hate when I watch a movie and I go, this would never happen. He would never say that. <laughs> exactly. She would never say that. That's what I loved about yeah. this is like there were so many scenes in it that, you know, even in a different context, I had kind of been in the same situation right um, so you can relate to it yeah i mean and my character in this film has her own story arc on the side where like she's kind of in like um, a friends with benefits situation but she's so worried about like her friend that she, you know the other girl says like oh well, what what about you you know what i mean like is this a do or don't kind of situation right. and then you know my character stacy she goes and and she decides and they get into an argument about it and but like everybody can relate to that too because they've everybody's been in limbo at least once or twice where they're like okay are we official or are we not official right, right, you know right, right. so oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's like I, I've, different... I've been there I've been yeah, there exactly. oh, yeah. so so Dan what was your role in the film uh, I was just I was well first I was a uh, second AD then I became first AD because like many things happened so he promoted me up he was like hey you've been coming to the, and helping out a lot more than everybody like a, a good percentage of like parts of the crew. And I got promoted quick, very fast for everything. But um, basically, I was just doing sound. I was doing uh, little things, like little touch-ups here and there. Like, I know, uh, I think it was one scene I had to, like, go in. Like, I'm like, Joe, this doesn't look this way. Or um, I had to remember exactly where they put a cup every single time. So it looked oh, yeah, yeah. like... Continuity. Oh. People for, Continuity, do not yeah. realize how oh, yeah. many takes it takes just to make sure that like one little flower was like the yeah. exact same way in both I'll scenes. tell you a funny story. I was acting in an indie film. We were out in Washington Square Park. It was bitter cold. Outside all day. Guy did 18, 19, 20 takes. <laughs> so the associate producer walks up to me and goes, Evan, what did you think? And I go... You want to know honestly what I thought? I go, maybe on a bit of cold day after the 20th <laughs> take, they could offer you some tea or some coffee and not treat you like meat. And exactly. I, I don't think he expected to hear that, but to me, acting is, 
is like a hobby. I'm yeah. more on the, mm -hmm. the producer's side. Yeah. So every once in a while, I'll do something for the fun of it. So I'm, you know, if somebody asks me, I'm not. We actually you know. had a day like that because um, we we just wrapped filming like two weeks ago. So a lot of this was between April and July, and there was that one weekend oh. where it was like 105 degrees every yeah. single day. And of course, that has to be when my scene is taking place in the fall. Right. So I was right. wearing a leather jacket and you're boots. pouring sweat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was so hot, and it was like, and it was nighttime too. It was still like in the mid 90s, and I'm like. And between every take, I'm taking off the leather jacket. I'm like fanning myself. Yeah, he's yeah. like, okay, now you're cold. And I'm yeah, like yeah. sitting there yeah. with this jacket. So you're suffering yeah, for exactly. your art. Exactly. So, so CJ, as somebody who's seen a zillion movies, what do you recommend um, filmmakers when you have a quality indie film? How do you? How does that film reach its audience? Find its audience? Um... See, now I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, oh, well, that's I'm why we don't pre interview. It's it spontaneous. <laughs> yeah, just like basically having the actors go out there, like people who are passionate about it. Like, you definitely sound like you were very passionate about acting in this I film, am. no matter how uncomfortable it was to film some stuff. But it, it sounds like you really liked the script and you believed in the project and you definitely I, I, stepped up and helped out. So, I, 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 seeing you guys be passionate about it makes me really want to be able to see it at some yeah. point. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, let me say something. I, I went to um, this film festival this mm -hmm. week. I was there three out of the ten days. There were there were films that were packed. The audience was full. There were days where it was practically empty. Yeah. And they had Q&As with the filmmakers. And I was tempted to say, where's your cast? How come they're not out supporting a film that they're in? Right. How come their friends and relatives aren't there why are we in an empty theater <laughs> you know it's um yeah. yeah i i think half the battle is believing in something and yep. promoting it and supporting yep. it oh, promoting you're it doing two radio thing. shows two excuse me two radio shows today yeah and that's promoting a film and right. getting yep. the word out and i think people like they they default to one kind of promotion or one type of marketing like they'll just do everything on instagram or they'll just do everything in person they'll just do everything on radio but i think a lot of it is like getting to different groups of people. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, not oh, everybody that listens to the radio is also on Instagram or vice versa, you know. Plus, so. the yeah. website is preaching the, to the converted. You yeah. have to reach beyond, exactly. you know, your social media. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, today, whoever you reach on my show, whoever you reach mm -hmm. on Under the Radar coming up, yep. you're going to reach new people. And your enthusiasm, both of you, yeah. is going to make people say, I want to see this film. Yeah, no. It's yep. I'm, curi I'm totally curious agree. to see it now. Excellent. You just yeah. type it in on Google. Well, well, there's a website for it, too. So. Yep. Yeah. And I, bet, I think uh, he, well, he's in, he's right now he's in, a, I guess, post-production. He's doing all the uh, the little, edit, let it, yeah, let it, let it, little edits that he needs. And he's, uh, I think he said that he was eventually going to get a, uh, a trailer up about mid-August or something like that. Yeah, so... We wrapped a couple weeks ago, so yep. now it's out of our hands. It's all. So uh, do you know that you know the cool. term high concept in film. Yes. Can you explain the film in ten words or less? How mm. would you explain this in ten words or less? Um, well, can, I mean, we could steal uh, Joe's. <laughs> he does it in high concept. Yeah. Always, Superman fights Batman. You know that's high concept. He always yeah. says, "I mean, I don't know if this is exactly yeah, ten words." Yeah. I remember but what, he's, his, I remember what he his said. His thing that he he his tag will say is. American Graffiti meets The Notebook. Perfect. Um, and then... Perfect. It was, after that. Oh, uh, driven by indie music. So yeah. all the music okay. in it is also... It's, so to explain for you, so uh, yeah, he says, American Graffiti meets The Notebook, driven by indie music. All of the songs were picked, I think, before he really did all the scene work. Right. Um, so a lot of the scenes are just musical. And he actually, the director specializes in um, music videos. Music videos. Okay. So this is kind of like a really long music video, a feature film based okay. on music. Yep. And I like what you said at the beginning about being from a guy's perspective as mm -hmm. well, because yeah. a lot of times, like like myself, I'll hear a oh, rom com. My wife will watch it. Yeah. I'm not, but if, if it has an appeal to men there's, and women, there's yeah. more. There's more men in it than women, and it's like there's a lot of like guy with guy scenes too where it's like oh we're just hanging out like so a little bit um like, that but, uh, they go to Las Vegas? Uh, oh uh the, uh, the, the hangover, hangover yeah so it's got like some of those kinds of funny guy scenes in it too okay, great. but also with you know the girly oh i love you kind of okay. scenes too yeah. okay <laughs> uh and cj what have you been watching lately what would you recommend 
Uh, I've honestly been seeing way too many movies this week because I had to see three movies in theaters for Randy's show. Uh, we saw The Meg, uh, Black Klansman, and we saw Teen Titans Go, the yeah. kids' movie, which honestly wasn't, wasn't actually on the uh, the uh, the list yeah, of his. But we realized but like, it was so, most it was, people had seen it because my friends dragged me to it, and then it's like, okay, we're watching it for the show now. Same here. But what do you recommend? Yeah. What's uh, must see? Well, see, I enjoyed the Meg a lot more than I thought I would. Like, I really thought it was going to be, like, a bad C- actor fighting a CGI monster thing that we've been getting. But mm-hmm. it actually had a pretty decent plot, and the actor, like, the supporting cast did a really great job. Jason Statham was just Jason Statham. He's yeah. always going to do the same <laughs> yeah. thing. Jason Statham plays Jason Statham in every movie. Yep. He, and he didn't deviate. It was literally just Jason Statham doing his thing. But the rest of the cast was actually really well done. Uh, I would say and Ruby I Rose enjoyed a lot of performances and made it and really sold the idea that you're fighting a 75 foot shark, but it didn't feel like a bad movie on the Sci-Fi Channel, which is what I thought we were going to get. Okay, yeah. so better than so, you expected. Yeah, definitely go see that one. And Black Klansman was a really well done drama with a lot of black comedy in it, but it's very powerfully done. Okay, yeah. what well, do you guys recommend? Oh, I de- oh, I, seeing the same the same uh, amount of stuff he said. Um, I I, I like the Meg, but I was like, eh. It was a typical shark movie, so I was like, eh, whatever. Uh, it wasn't Jaws. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Jaws, I, I went in with the seat. lowest yeah. expectations. I'm like, oh, that was actually pretty well done. Yeah, I walked in there, I walked out, and I'm like, oh, I was, I, Randy was sitting next to me. I'm like, well, he goes, what did I miss during this part? I'm like, not much. They yeah. basically said, the shark's there. He goes, really? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw a skyscraper with the rock. Oh. I was kind of like, this This is like a poor man's die hard. Yep. It really Not is. Not for one yeah. second did <laughs> I think he was going to die. Yeah, no, he's hanging it, off of buildings. I go, he's not going to fall. Yeah. And, you know. it was, yeah, it wasn't great effects. wasn't great action. But I actually really liked The Rock's performance. Like, he actually acted in this movie. Yeah. yeah. Like, him and the family the was thing. the best part. He had some moments yeah. of vulnerability. The is when they have, like, a really bad... Uh, script and the actor is like really into it and yeah, you're just like, yeah. taking that contact or, like, like The Rock overboard. and the family did a great job like I really believe them as a family like I would have yep. watched a movie about yeah. them and then the bad guys give the hammiest performance oh, I've ever yes. seen it like so it's so bad it, it, was, it, was, it was like Die Hard 2018 but nowhere near as good yeah. right. as the original like, yeah. and that and like their their accents were just way over the top I'm going to you you stole from me I take back from you <laughs> I, I can't place their accent and like the bad guy's name I can't remember, but it's like Bashi Kose or something yeah. like that. And like the, it's like who could be doing this? And the guy's just like Bashi Kose. I'm like, was was that a Russian word? Was that a name? I couldn't tell. And it was only through I thought it, through the movie that they say this is this guy's name. And I'm like, oh, that's what that was. Yeah. I thought it was chocolate syrup when he kept saying. His yeah, name. Like, I, I'm like Bosco. Holy shit, Bosco. Yeah, I didn't know what he was my, saying. My my mother used to call movies like that a piece of fluff. It's like uh, you watch it and you forget about it by the yeah, next and day. With all the, um, the way you can edit things now and oh. all the CGI and stuff. Yeah. It's like people are just making it for that. They don't care about the plot line at all. Again, I'm, I'm just tired of buildings blowing up. Yeah. Especially coming yeah. from I New York. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. We were talking about that before yep. we went on. We were, I was just like, there's only so much blood and gore that I yeah, can watch before with horror it's films not and necessary anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so uh, anything you guys want to plug? Any websites, uh, social media? Um, coming projects well you can follow broken hearted the movie on instagram and facebook and there's also if you go on google broken hearted the movie is on there and what about your own social media um you can follow me at instagram on j.co100 jennifer covey <laughs> okay okay me i'm on instagram with shaggy1331 uh facebook shaggy gb um also check out uh, my ghostbuster group uh, the new york city ghostbusters we actually just did a uh, big event over at uh the Intrepid, where they were showing the original uh, 84 movie on the flight deck, which was actually really cool, because he was just like, I'm on top of the Intrepid, and I'm watching Ghostbusters. I'm like... <laughs> and you're a yeah. Ghostbuster. And I'm a Ghostbuster, really so it was really... really it sounded awesome. I was like, this, this is amazing. Uh, CJ? Yeah. Um, you can check out the production group I work with, Eternal Lion Studios. I do with uh, filmmakers Jake Ramos and Vinny Bonfante, they've done a lot of great stuff, and I'm the screenwriter on like the next two things that they're working on. So hopefully, okay. we'll have more stuff coming out soon. All right, tell them to come on my show mm-hmm. one Sunday. Yeah, every will. Sunday. Speaking of which, Jim, next Sunday we're gonna have you uh, working hard. We got three bands on next Sunday. Nice. Ooh. Three musical acts in one show, so uh, that'll be special. 
And uh, speaking of special, we have uh, Unger the Radar with Randy Unger in just a few minutes. Yep. So, uh, and you guys are all going to be on that as well. Yes, yep. we are. So you're like, you're like on a promotional tour <laughs> Pretty today. Much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Now so, we just got to think of more stuff to say. Yeah. 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 Well, well we, it, we have a minute or two left. Um, anything on TV you guys recommend? Uh, I don't know. I watch. mean, I know some. I just started watching. Well, I, it had already been out, but um, Atypical on Netflix is mm. surprisingly really good. It's mm. about. Um, oh, yeah, I've heard good things about it. Yeah, it's it's got a, a season two coming out, but it's basically about a boy with autism. And what I really like about it is like you've seen TV shows where. Um, people are autistic in the show or have right. special needs but like never as a protagonist at least i've never seen that right, right. so it's like hmm. kind of an interesting perspective to see it from somebody interesting yeah their perspective as opposed to somebody else looking on at them you're all probably too young for this but on saint elsewhere the hospital drama which is a classic tv drama the very last episode they they show the entire series as viewed through the eyes of an autistic kid yeah I, I mean, know, and I everybody like show, flipped out. Yeah. Like the whole like eight oh, years yeah. was, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's like that, but it's huh. you know, not quite as dramatic as seen elsewhere. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it's nice seeing a show where it's like they really look into it and respect it and do it. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's coming yeah. from well his done. perspective yeah. the whole time, so it's like kind of nice. It's not like oh, this is just my sibling that's like this or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's not like pulling a, what was it, um, what's eating Gilbert Grape kind of thing, where it's like okay, yeah. we're focusing yeah, exactly, on him, but we're exactly. mainly focusing on the family. Right. Dan, what are you watching? Anything uh, TV worth, worth seeing? Well, no, I, I haven't watched TV in a long time. I've just been like watching YouTube and stuff. Okay, okay. <laughs> but there's a lot of different CJ? YouTubers. Yeah. Uh, same here. I've just been... I've only got to watch like a few shows. Like I watch uh, Preacher on AMC. I've been really enjoying doing a good job adapting the comic book series from the 90s. Okay, okay. So that'll about do it, folks. Um, Actress Jennifer Covey and uh, Dan Shaggy, C.J. Oakland. We'd also like to thank wrestlers Nia Kennedy and Chris Michaels and uh, Jim Savalli, uh, our fearless leader. And uh, that should about do it. Randy Unger's Unger the Radar in just a moment. Stay tuned for that. This is the Evan Ginsberg Show, always an eclectic mix here at VillageConnectionRadio.com. Signing off. Are you at home? 